So for exam three, problem number one was to find all quadratic residues modulo 19. So the number of quadratic residues is going to be 19 minus one, there are 18 non-zero congruence classes. And half of them are quadratic residues. So there's nine of them. So all you have to do is just take the squares of the first nine positive integers. One squared is one, two squared is four, three squared is nine, four squared is 16, everything is modulo 19. Five squared is 25, which is the same as six. Six squared is 36, which modulo 19 is the same as 17, I think. And seven squared is 49. Let's see, 38, that means 11. And eight squared is 64. Which is, let's see, 64 minus seven is 57 is three times 19. And nine squared, which is 81 is five because four times 19 is 76. So the quadratic residues modulo 19 are, if we put them in order, one, four, five, six, seven, nine, 11, 16 and 17, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. I got them all, okay? Any questions about that? For problem two, <clears throat> Prove that two is a primitive root mod 11. So phi of 11 is 10. So every integer a such that a and 11 are relatively prime has an order mod 11 that is a divisor of 10. That is, what are the positive divisors of 10? One, two, five, and 10. So two to the first power is two mod 11. Two squared is four mod 11. Two to the fifth is 32 is minus one mod 11. So two does not have order one, two, or five. So two must have order 10 modulo 11. That means two is a primitive root. I mean, you could also take two and raise it to all powers until you get to one. So you're computing, uh, 10 different powers of two, that's perfectly okay. People did that and you got the right answer and you got full credit, but it's slightly easier to do it like this. Okay, this is part A. Any questions about that? 
part B, several people got wrong because they didn't understand the definition of the index. So the index of six modulo 11 with respect to the primitive root two is the smallest positive integer k such that two to the k is congruent to six mod 11. You're not raising six to a power, you're looking to see what power of two gives you six. And if you start calculating the powers of two, I don't see any other way to do it. Two, four, eight, 16, 32, and so forth. <clears throat> the first time you get a power of two, which is equal to six is two to the ninth. Two to the ninth is 512. You divide 11 into 512. That leaves a remainder of six. So 512 is congruent to six mod 11. So the index of six with respect to the primitive root two is equal to nine. Okay. Right. Any questions about this? And part C is find all primitive roots mod 11. So one way to do it, which is just to try every possible number from 2 to 11, actually 3 to 10, because you know one's not a primitive root and you know 2 is. But because 2 is a primitive root mod 11, So take any number G, let's say a positive integer. So G is always two to the K mod P for some K because two is a primitive root. And maybe I'll call this uh, L for some L. And g to the k is congruent to one mod p is the same as saying two to the l k is congruent to one mod p. And this is the case precisely when this exponent l k is congruent to zero modulo, sorry, this is mod p, it's, we're looking mod 10 mod 11 rather, but it makes it likely easier. So, so that to be a primitive root mod 11, well, we know that. Um, so take any number G relatively prime to P. So G is congruent to some power of two, they say two to the L mod 11. And G to the K is one mod 11 means two to the LK is one mod 11 which means LK is congruent to zero mod 10. <clears throat> and if L and 10 are relatively prime, that means that if 10 divides LK and it doesn't divide L, then K is congruent to zero mod 10 which means G is a primitive root. Because the smallest power 
of G that is one mod 11 would have to be a divisor of 10, would have to be a multiple of 10. So you only have to look at numbers L that are relatively prime to 10. And the integers between one and 10 that are relatively prime to 10, we know there are four of them. B of 10 is equal to four. And the numbers relatively prime to 10 between one and 10 are one, three, seven, and nine. So the primitive roots mod 11 are two to the first power, which is congruent to two mod 11. That's what we started with. Two cubed, which is eight mod 11. Two to the seventh, two to the seventh is 128. If you divide that by 11, you get seven mod 11. And two to the ninth, which is 512, which we already saw is six mod 11. So the primitive roots are two, six, seven, and eight. Okay. Any questions about that? So the Legendre symbol, if A and P are relatively prime, A over P is defined to be one if A is a quadratic residue. Mod P and minus one if A is not a quadratic residue or in other words, a quadratic non-residue mod p. And to calculate the Legendre symbols, so 5 over 11, 5 is congruent to 1 mod 4, so this is 11 over 5. You can flip it. 11 is congruent to 1 mod 5, and 1 is certainly a quadratic residue because 1 squared is congruent to 1. So 5 over 11, 11 over 5 are both equal to 1. 14 over 17, you can flip this over because this is not a prime in the numerator. But this is 2 times 7 over 17. And the Legendre symbol is multiplicative. 2 over 17, 17 is 1 mod 8. So this is plus 1. So this is just 7 over 17. 17 is congruent to one mod four. These are both primes. So you can flip this over. 17 is congruent to three mod seven. So you can either leave it like that or say, okay, well, three and seven are both primes congruent to three, congruent to three mod four. So if I flip this, this is minus seven over three. Seven is the same as one mod three. And mine, one over three is one, so this is minus one. That's one way to do it. For minus 95 over 101, again, you could factor the numerator. You cannot flip it over because this is certainly not a prime. This is minus one times five times 19 over 101 which is the Legendre symbol minus one over 101, five over 101, 19 over 101. 101 is one mod four, so this is plus one. These are primes congruent to one mod four, so I can flip this over. That's 101 over five. 19 is three mod four, but 101 is one mod four, so I can also flip this over. 101 is congruent to one mod five. 101, 101 is congruent to six mod 19. 
I can't flip this over because six is a prime, is a composite number, it's two times three, but one over five is one. So this is two times three over 19, Perfect. which is two over 19, three over 19. 19 is congruent to what mod eight is congruent to three. So this is minus one and three over 19, 19 is three mod four. If I flip this over, I change the sign. So this is minus one from this times minus one, 19 over three, 19 is one mod three and minus one times one is one. So this is one over three or one. So, Professor, yes, a quick question for these problems uh, from the beginning. Can you just say that negative 95 over 101 is just six over 101? Exactly. So I was going to say this is one way to do it. But if you want, you can also say that minus 95 is congruent to six mod 101. So minus 95 over 101 is six over 101. That's two over 101, three over 101. 101, let's see, um, 101 is five mod eight. So this is a minus one. And three over 101 is 101 over three, which is two over three, which is minus one. So I get minus one times minus one is plus one. So you can also do it this way and it's completely up to you. This is actually a little bit nicer because it's, you get a small number right away and it's quicker. There's much less, there's less work, but in any case, there's only one correct answer and however you get it is fine. Any other questions about this? Okay, that was problem three. Problem four is to find all solutions to some congruences. So the first is x squared congruent to 13 mod 17. It's nice to know before we start if there's a solution. So you look at the Legendre symbol 13 over 17. These are each primes congruent to one mod four. So that's 17 over 13. 17 is four mod 13 and four is two squared. So this is certainly a quadratic residue. So we know there's a solution and it's just a matter of looking for one. And I don't know that there's any, um, easy way necessarily to find a solution. Um, I guess you just have to look. You just start squaring numbers mod 17. I mean, there's there are a couple of little shortcuts you could try, but um, so just you could just say. Try one error. Start squaring numbers until you get to 13. And you will see that eight squared, which is 65, is congruent to 13 mod 17, because 65 minus 13 is, oops, is that right? Sorry, eight squared is 64. 64 minus 13 is 51, which is three times 17. And so minus a squared will also be 64, will also be 13, and minus eight is the same as nine, mod 17. So the solutions are x congruent to eight or nine, mod 17. There's also another way you could do it, I guess. So x squared congruent to 13, 
13 is the same as minus four or minus two squared mod 17 and four squared is 16 is minus one mod 17. So if you want x squared congruent to minus four, which is minus one times four, minus one is four squared and four is two squared. So this is eight squared mod 17. So you get eight right away as a solution and then minus eight gives you the other solution. But either any way you do it, it's fine. It's just a matter of doing solving the problem. So this was A, part B, we want to find all solutions to the quadratic congruence, x squared congruent to 14, mod 17. So again, to see if there are solutions, we calculate the Legendre symbol, 14 over 17. This is two times seven over 17. That's two over 17, seven over 17. 17 is one, mod eight, so this is plus one. So this is seven over 17. 17 is one mod four, so I can use quadratic reciprocity. This is 17 over seven. 17 is the same as three mod seven. These are both congruent to three mod four, so this is minus seven over three. Seven is one mod three, so this is minus one over three. So this is minus one. <clears throat> so there's no solution. The Legendre symbol tells us that there's no solution to this congruence. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. Problem five is to solve some quadratic congruences. The first is x squared plus six x plus nine congruent to zero mod 17. <clears throat> of course, this you recognize as x plus three squared congruent to zero mod 17. So the only time the square of an integer is zero mod 17 is when the integer x plus three is zero mod 17, which means x is congruent to minus three or 14 mod 17. So the solution is all x congruent to 14 mod 17. Okay. For part B, we have the quadratic congruence x squared plus 15x plus nine congruent to zero mod 17. I mean, as some people thought they could use the quadratic formula, which doesn't make sense unless you're extremely careful when you're working with congruences, but you can get this to look something like a square because 15 is the same as minus two mod 17. So this is the same as x squared minus two x plus nine congruent to zero mod 17. Or you could write x squared minus two x congruent to minus nine mod 17. Just brought this over to the other side. And I can make this a perfect square by adding one, but I have to add one to both sides, plus one, plus one. So I get x minus one squared is congruent to minus eight. Minus eight is the same as nine mod 17. So when do you get a square which is equal to nine? x minus one is congruent to plus or minus three mod 17, right? <clears throat> the only numbers whose squares are nine, mod 17 are plus three and minus three. So you get either x is congruent to one plus three, 
which is 4 mod 17, or x congruent to 1 minus 3, which is minus 2, which is 15 mod 17. So the solutions to this quadratic congruence are x congruent to 4 or 15 mod 17. <clears throat> Okay. Any questions about this? A lot of people didn't get this one right. Problem six was to find all solutions of the congruence x cubed congruent to one mod 13. So <clears throat> the simplest thing to do, uh, unless you have a primitive root mod 13, which at the moment we don't, is to start cubing numbers. One cubed is congruent to one mod 13, two cubed is congruent to eight, three cubed is 27 is congruent to one mod 13, four cubed is 64, let's see, mod 13, 13 times um, four is 52, this is minus one. Not congruent to plus one. Five cubed is 125. 125 is like minus five, which is the same as eight. Mod 13. Six cubed is 216. If you divide 216 by 13, I think you get a remainder of eight again. Seven cubed is 343. And if you divide that by 13, you get five. A cubed, actually, <clears throat> I can make it easier. A cubed is Eight is the same as minus five minus thir mod 13. So eight cubed is minus five cubed. Five cubed is eight. So this is minus eight or also five mod 13. Nine cubed, let's see, nine is the same as minus four. So that's minus four cubed. Four cubed is minus one, minus minus one. Here we get a plus one. Let's, see, let's keep going just for fun. 10 cubed is minus three cubed is minus three cubed. That's minus one. 11 cubed is minus two cubed, which is minus two cubed, which is minus eight. <clears throat> minus eight is again five. And 12 cubed is minus one cubed, mod 13 is minus one. In any case, what are the numbers whose cubes are one? One, three, and nine. So, x cubed is congruent to one, mod 13. If and only if x is congruent to one, three or nine mod 13. That's the answer. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. So in problem seven, we have 
a primitive root G mod P and an integer A relatively prime to P. And we want to prove A is a quadratic residue if and only if the index of A mod P is even. So suppose the index of A with respect to the primitive root G is even. That means it's 2K for some integer K. So that means that G to the 2K is congruent to A mod P. And if you let X be G to the K mod P, then X squared is G to the K squared is G to the 2K is A mod P. So if the index of A with respect to G is an even number, then A is a primitive root. The Legendre symbol is one. So that's the proof in one direction. So in the other direction, suppose A is a primitive root mod P. Then there exists X such that X squared is congruent to A mod P. Suppose X is G to the K mod P. Because G is a primitive root. So every number not zero mod P is a power of G. So X squared, which is G to the K squared, which is G to the 2K is congruent to A mod P. So A is an even power of the primitive root G. Now, G has order P minus one, which is even. What this implies is then that the index of A with respect to the primitive root G it's either 2K or 2K minus some even number, which is still even, is even. But this is basically the, what you need to observe. If A is a quadratic residue, then there's some X such that X squared is A, X is G to the K, that means A is G to the 2K, and this is an even number. That's really all you need to do. That's the whole exam. Any questions about that? Any of this? Okay. So let me pause for a second while I check the. Lecture 26 is on what are called pseudo primes. and Carmichael numbers. And part of this is motivated by the following question. Given an odd integer n, answer the following question. Is n a prime number, how do you tell? So we know by 
the sieve of Aratosthenes, if N is composite, then N has a divisor D such that D, it's at least two, but no bigger than the square root of N, okay? So in principle, if you wanna know whether is a number, whether an integer is prime, in fact, I only have to look at odd numbers. You just have to look at all the divisors of the number, just do trial divisions. Just divide by all the numbers up to the square root of n. Of course, the problem is that if n is huge, the square root of n is also huge. And you don't have enough time, even with the world's biggest supercomputers, to determine by checking all divisors, by doing all these test divisions, whether or not the integer is prime. But we can apply, so, Let's just say, so it's too hard. That means too much calculation. To solve this problem by iterated trial divisions. Right? So that would work in principle, but it doesn't work in practice. But we do have something about primes that we know, which is Fermat's theorem. Fermat's theorem says that if n is prime, then an odd prime, I, I mean, there's no reason to look at this at two, the only even number that's prime is two. Um, then two and n are relatively prime. And so two to the n minus one is congruent to one mod n. And in general, if b is any number which is relatively prime to n, then b to the n minus one is congruent to one mod n if n is prime. So if you think about this says that for every integer b or every base b, we're taking, if we look at powers of b, we have a primality test. It doesn't work in both directions, but it says if b and n are relatively prime, and n is prime, then b to the n minus one is congruent to one mod n. So if this congruence fails to hold for some b, then we know that n is not a prime. It doesn't tell us if n is a prime, but it, it's a way to say that n is not a prime. Right? So as an indication of this, as an example, this is an example that is, I did in the, in the book. Suppose we ask the following question, is the number N equal to 851 prime or composite? So let's compute two to the n minus one, which is two to the power 850 mod 851. Now, let me suggest that what you probably don't want to do is start, is calculate the first 850 
um, powers of two. That's a, a big calculation. So suppose we try, I mean, you can do that, but life is short and you don't want to spend that much of your life doing this calculation. So let's consider the two attic representation of 850. That is, we write 850 as a sum of powers of two. And see, how do we do that? 850, well, the largest power of two we could pick is 512. Let me just do my calculations over here. 850 minus 512 is 200 uh, is 338. The largest power of two less than 338 is 256. If I subtract 256, I get uh, 82. Uh, the largest power of two less than 82 is 64. That's 18. The largest power of two less than 18 is 16. So this looks like 850 is two to the first power plus two to the fourth power plus two to the sixth power plus two to the eighth power plus two to the ninth power. And we know that two to the two to two to the power two to the n. Two to the n is two to the n minus one times two. So this is two to the two to the n minus one squared, right? That's just arithmetic. So we can use that to calculate two to the various powers of two. Let's try. So, two squared is four mod 851. And actually two to the fourth we know, two to the fourth is just 16. That's two to the two squared. Of course, I could also have said this is two squared squared, which is four squared, which is 16. Maybe I'll do this on a, on a paper. So let me do this on a clean sheet. So I have 850, two to the first plus two to the fourth plus two to the sixth plus two to the eighth plus two to the ninth. And two to the first is two, is everything is mod 851. Two squared is four. Two to the two squared is two squared squared, which is four squared, which is 16. Two to the two cubed That's two to the two squared squared. That's 16 squared, which is 256 mod 851. Two to the two to the fourth is two to the two cubed squared. That's going to be trying to avoid a lot of calculations. So this is 256 squared. I guess I did this calculation and when you do it, this is nine mod 851, two to the two to the fifth is two to the two to the fourth squared, 
which is 9 squared, which is 81. This is all mod 851. 2 to the 2 to the 6th is 2 to the 2 to the 5th squared, which is 81 squared. I guess you do this and you get 604. 2 to the 2 to the 7th is 604 squared, which is 588. 2 to the 2 to the 8th is 588 squared, which is 238. And 2 to the 2 to the 9th is 238 squared, which is 478. So the powers of two that I need are two to the first power, two to the fourth power, oops, two to the two to the fourth, two to the two to the two to, to the sixth, two to the two to the eighth, and two to the two to the ninth. So let me just so I want two to the power eight hundred and fifty, right? I'm interested in whether this is congruent to one mod eight fifty one or not. So this is two to the two to the first plus two to the fourth plus two to the sixth plus two to the eighth plus two to the ninth. This is two to the two to the first, two to the two to the fourth, two to the two to the sixth, two to the two to the eighth, two to the two to the ninth. Everything is mod 851. Oops, this is the one I want, two to the two to the first power. Two squared is four. 2 to the 2 to the 4th is 9. 2 to the 2 to the 6th is 604. 2 to the 2 to the 8th is 238. 2 to the 2 to the 9th is 478. You multiply them together and divide by 851, you get 169. Mod 851, which is not one mod 851. So by Fermat's theorem, which we call, could call the Fermat primality test, 851 is not a prime. Right? Remember, if 851 were a prime, 2 to the 851 would be congruent to 1 mod 850. But we did this calculation and we saw that 2 to the 850 is 169. It's not 1 mod 851. So 851 is composite. In fact, there's a sneaky thing you can do, which is the following. 851 is 900 minus 49, right? So whether you, I mean, this is elementary school, right? 900 minus 49 is 851, but 900 is 30 squared and 49 is seven squared. So a squared minus b squared factors, this is 30 minus seven times 30 plus seven. So I have a factorization of 851. It's equal to 33, sorry, it's equal to 23 times 37. That's pretty good. So all of this work told me that 851 was composite but this little bit of elementary arithmetic, very clever, but elementary arithmetic, tells me that this number is composite and it actually gives me the factorization.
Okay. So what we have is quite interesting. And also should say that this is, um, you might say a really important part of applied mathematics because all of internet commerce, all of international banking, all of the most secure codes used by the CIA and the US military and every other military and intelligence agency in the world are somehow based on some number theory and knowing whether or not a number is a prime. And um, so a huge amount of money is invested every year or spent every year trying to figure out a way to determine if a number is a prime and if it's not a prime, if it's composite, how to factor it. Um, people, uh, there are companies that do this and make a lot of money. In any case, what we have is um, not a solution to the problem of telling whether or not a number is a prime. What we have is um, a test that can prove is a number is composite, but we can't prove it's prime. So Fermat's theorem gives a way to tell if a number is composite, but does not prove that a number is prime. That is, if you have some number n, and if b and n are relatively prime, and b to the n minus one is not congruent to one mod n, then n <coughs> is composite. If b and n are relatively prime, and b to the n minus one is congruent to one mod n, then we get no information at all. Right? Because you can have b to the n minus one congruent to one mod n, and then it's not a prime. We just don't know. So, so if the test works, it tells you that number is composite, but if it doesn't work, you have no information. And you can ask how likely is it that a number is composite, but this congruence is satisfied. So we make the following definition the integer n will be called a pseudo prime if, or a pseudo prime to base b, if b to the n minus one is congruent to one mod n. So every prime, so b and n are relatively prime, of course. Every prime is a pseudo prime, but not every pseudo prime is a prime. Um, let's see, what is an example? Um, suppose we let N be the number 341 which is composite. If you divide this by 11, you get uh, 31. So this is composite. 341 is 11 times 31. Now, Suppose we let B equal two. So 11 is a prime. 
So two to the 10 is congruent to one mod 11. So two to the, see if n is 341, n minus one is 340, which is 34 times 10. So two to the 340th is two to the 10th to the 34th, two to the 10th is one, so this is one mod 11. Thirty-one, two to the fifth is thirty-two, which is congruent to one mod thirty-one. So two to the three hundred and fortieth, right? Three thirty, three forty is thirty-four times ten, so it's also sixty-eight times five. So this is two to the fifth to the sixty-eighth, and two to the fifth is one, so this is congruent to one mod 31. So two to the 340th power is congruent to one mod 11 and congruent to one mod 31. That means two to the 340th minus one is divisible by 11 and 31. They're relatively prime. So it's divisible to the, by their product. So two to the 340th is congruent to one mod 341. So with respect to the base B equal to two, 341, this is a pseudo prime to base two. If you take N to be 341, two to the N minus one is congruent to one mod N. So it's a pseudo prime, but it's not a prime. We see that 341 does factor. Now, suppose we look at 341 and we choose a different base. So 341, which we know is 11 times 31. Suppose we take base B equal to seven. We want to compute seven to the power 340 mod 341. Again, you can't just raise seven to this power because it will take you forever. So we have to try to be um, a little bit more clever. So we know that seven cubed is 343 which is two mod 341. And we know that two to the 10th, that's 1024. If you divide by 341, let's see, 341 times three is three to is 1023, so this is one mod 341. So we can say the following, seven to the power 340, this is seven to the power one plus 339 plus 339 plus one is 340. This is seven and 339 is a seven to the first power. And this is 339 is three times 113. So this is seven cubed to the power 113. And seven cubed is two. This is all mod 341.
and this is seven. We know that two to the 10th is one. 113 is three plus 110, which is three plus 10 times 11. So this is seven times two cubed times two to the 110th. which is two to the 10th to the 11th power. Everything is mod 341. And two to the 10th is one. So this is just one. This is seven times eight. This is 56, which is well known not to be one. Mod 341. So we have seven to the 340th power is not congruent to one mod 341, so 341 is composite. So if we applied Fermat's test to the number 341 with base seven, we would see that 341 was a composite number. If you apply Fermat's test to 341 with base two, you got no information because it was one. So the question is, can every composite number be proved composite by some use of Fermat's test? That is, if a number is composite, is, there's always, is there always a base B where B to the number minus one is not congruent to one? And the answer, and this is somewhat surprising, is no. So there exist numbers which are called Carmichael numbers. The so Carmichael number is a positive integer n such that b to the n minus one is congruent to one mod n for all numbers b relatively prime to n. and it's composite. So a Carmichael number is a number which will pass every Fermat test for primality, but it still is composite. And there's a big theorem that says Carmichael numbers exist. And the smallest example is the number 561, which is composite. It's divisible by three, it's divisible by 11. In fact, it's three times 11 times 17. Um, so this is really very interesting. Um, and maybe I'll wait until Wednesday to prove this result, but. Um, so this is section 2.6 in the book, and it's worth reading. It's extremely interesting that how you can use Fermat's theorem as a primality test, how it doesn't always work. And in fact, there's some numbers we can prove which are composite, but nonetheless, it passes every Fermat primality test. All right. Any questions about this? Uh, if not, I think then I am going to stop right now. See you on Wednesday.
I will be posting office hours. I'm going to have office hours basically every day this week, maybe every day until the final. So, but I'll post the schedule very soon. Okay.